I was employed at the historical department of the church from, uh, 18, from 1979 to 1997. And from 1985 until I left employment there to come to the Lee Library at BYU, it was my assignment to acquire and preserve printed material relating to Mormonism. This, of course, in, included the unparalleled uh, collection of Book of Mormons held in the church library. I had been prepared for this assignment uh, in part because of my association with the eminent bibliographer Chad Flake, for whom I had worked at, as a student at BYU. I met Royal in 1988, about the time he began this project, and it became my good fortune to work with him by providing him access to copies of the various editions of the Book of Mormon from the church's superb collection. We arranged for access to numerous editions from 1830 to 1920. In most cases, copies of these books were scanned at the Humanities Research Center here at BYU and thus were put into electronic form, which has facilitated the analysis of the textual changes. Um, let me just briefly mention here again uh, the exhibit that we've put on at uh, the special collections. We display the first f four editions of the Book of Mormon and also the 1911, its so-called 1920 committee copy, um, and it shows corrections to the text made by James E. Talmadge. This e exhibit will remain up until uh, March 25th. It should be noted that here that in 1988, it was not entirely clear which editions or printings of the Book of Mormon were textually important to the critical text project. Consequently, a not insignificant task for the project was discovering which printings needed careful examination. Of course, it was known from earlier research which Book of Mormons were indeed distinct editions. Uh, at this point, I probably should define uh, a couple of terms. The term edition refers to copies printed from a new typesetting, while the term printing, which is sometimes referred to as an impression, typically describes those copies printed from some form of stereotype plate. Often all three terms are used interchangeably, but strictly speaking, they do not mean the same thing. In most cases, copies of the second printing or later printings are identical textually with those of a first printing because the same plates are used for both. Usually, the only difference between the two printings is simply a change in the date on the title page. And usually, the bibliographic description of the book tells you all you need to know. In 1988, there was good bibliographic description of virtually all printings of the Book of Mormon. But it was not the case that bibliographic information alone always told the textual story. By my count, there are about 150 different English editions or printings of the Book of Mormon issued between 1830 and 1981. Most of these are second, third, fourth, tenth impressions made from stereotype, electrotype, or, or some other form of printing plate. Using stereographic plates allowed the church to easily print needed copies to meet the demands of members and of missionary work. Because later printings from stereotype plates normally are not textually different from the first printing of a new edition, it was not necessary to examine in depth all the 150 odd printings. However, at the very least, it was necessary to determine which printing needed a thorough examination. Remember, there was no one to tell Royal, well, you need to look at this printing or you don't need to look at that printing. Um, he had to discover that for himself. And indeed, he did discover that some printings did justify a closer examination than was previously thought necessary because it turns out that printing plates can be corrected as well as single, <coughs> single type additions. Thus, counter to what one might expect, not all printings are created equal. Some of the findings resulting in Royal's careful study turned out to be quite illuminating, and we will hear 
tonight some of those findings. Before I turn the time over to Royal, um, let me say that my experience and association with him have been nothing but enlightening. But even more importantly for me, it has also been nothing but faith promoting. Royal has looked for clues to the original text in places no one has looked before. He has been willing to dig deeply to a depth no one in the past has had the dedication and energy to do. He has brought to this project a combination of commitment, knowledge, and training. But most significant of all, he has brought to this study a faith in the divinity of the Book of Mormon. A scholar without his faith would have long ago given up and produced a superficial study. Indeed, there have been antagonists in the past who have done just such superficial studies. I am especially grateful for Royal's tenacious and faithful efforts. We all benefit from this monumental project as we make our own lifetime study of the Book of Mormon. I'll turn the time over to Royal. Okay, so tonight we're going to be talking about the editions of the Book of Mormon. And in general, we will be talking about editions, as Larry uh, mentioned the term. But there are some printings with changes that uh, are quite important. Um, I would like, you know, you... Those of you that came the first time, we talked about the manuscripts of the Book of Mormon, which have played a role, actually, in the first three printings of the Book of Mormon in a very direct way. Today, we will talk about the printed editions, and next time, we will actually get into the text of the Book of Mormon itself and some very surprising results from the Critical Text Project. And many of us have mentioned already the exhibit that is in the library. I recommend that you go see it. You can also see quite a few artifacts, stages in the critical text project and things which have been discovered. Oops. Okay. Let me also point out before we move on further, there are two items that were not out there with the bookstore's uh, sale last week, but you might be interested in. Uh, one of them is called Uncovering the Original Text of the Book of Mormon. And many of the slides you saw last time showing the uh, manuscripts and, and the conservation of them and so forth are all contained within this. And they brought copies tonight. Uh, and you might want, might be interested in those. The other uh, item that I would like to point out is that when volume four, the first part of it in 2004 was published, this is the analysis of textual variants. It's the first big maroon book here. Um, several scholars did reviews of this project and if you're interested in getting their ideas of the importance of this project I would recommend this as well it's an issue of Book of Mormon studies okay so there are three basic uh, aspects that we want to look at tonight first we're going to look at the LDS textual tradition and then the RLDS, the uh, RLDS Church is now called the Community of Christ, but all of the editions were published while they were known as the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so I'm going to use the RLDS term. Uh, and then we're going to talk about modern trade editions, books of Mormon that are being published basically in the last decade or so um, that are being published independently of either of these churches. So the LDS textual tradition. Uh, 
we first look at the, the three editions that were first published, uh, the 1830 in Palmyra, 1837 in Kirtland, and Nauvoo, 1840. I might point out that the Nauvoo edition, it says Nauvoo on the title page, and that is correct, uh, but it was actually printed in Cincinnati, and Joseph Smith sent Ebenezer Robinson with a marked up copy of the 37 edition, and he worked with the printer there in Cincinnati, and the first printing of from the plates they made, they made a stereotype plate there, he took delivery in Cincinnati and used it for distributing the book to Latter-day Saints uh, in the eastern part of the United States, not in Nauvoo. And so in a way, this is, I, I like to call it the Cincinnati Nauvoo edition because it's actually published in Cincinnati, despite what's on the title page. Then there are three British editions that are going to play an important role. Uh, they all list Liverpool. I might point out the last one was actually uh, public, or printed in London. But the th those three editions are the Latter-day Saint editions, usually identified as such. Um, and the 1841 we sometimes just call the British edition because Joseph Smith is still alive, but really had not much to do with its printing. And the other ones, his uh, involvement was more important, the first three. Um, since 1852, I would say there are three really important LDS editions from a formatting point of view and an editing point of view. Um, the first one you may be familiar with, and we'll be talking about it a little bit. It was done by Orson Pratt in 1879, and then 1920 edition, which is being really spearheaded by James E. Talmage, although there was a committee and a uh, member of the First Presidency and Apostles. The remaining records seem to indicate that the real active leadership of the, role, of the work on that edition is Talmage. But a surprising one is this middle one, and we'll talk about that as we get to it. Um, so the 1830 edition, one of the characteristics of it is that it has little grammatical editing. And as you read it, you will see things that might surprise you from a um, dialectal point of view. It is, in many cases, in non-standard usage. And the printer, himself, or the typesetter, John Gilbert, asked if he shouldn't correct the grammar. And uh, the three brethren that were in charge of it, that was Oliver Cowdery and Hiram Smith, and Martin Harris consulted. And then Martin Harris said, no, set it as it is. The Old Testament is ungrammatical too. <laughs> now how Martin would know if the Old Testament was ungrammatical is an open question. But it basically the typesetter did set what was in the manuscripts. So there were ungrammatical things set, although occasionally he would make them standard English. Whether he consciously did this in the beginning, there are a few places where he may have just accidentally changed a they was to they were. But when he got near the end, he was actually marking up the manuscript occasionally with a grammatical editing on his part. Um, John Gilbert is, um, well, let me just say that the the Palmyra edition is the closest one of the printed editions to the original text if you take the language, the grammar, into account. Um, it nonetheless has got numerous errors in transmission that occurred. There are few errors, I think, in the original manuscript itself, and there's transmission errors as the, as the scribes copied to make the printer's manuscript, and then the typesetter is going to make errors. And each of the, the last two stages, they're making about three changes 
per manuscript page. We call these pages substantive changes, not that they are necessarily really meaningful and have substance to them, but that means it's a change in a word or a word form to another word. And we'll come back to this issue when we consider the 2013 edition that the church has just published. So John Gilbert, the 1830 typesetter, is going to provide what are called the accidentals. The original, the manuscripts came to him basically as one continuous sentence. Each long chapter that was originally there begins with a capital letter with the first word and it'll go all the way to the end. There is no punctuation, no periods, commas, anything. There's no real capitalization so that sentences aren't identified by the beginning of a capital letter, you'll have just, and it came to pass. In fact, that helps you figure out, hey, probably a new sentence here. <laughs> so he is going to do what are called the accidentals. Uh, this term comes from Aristotle, and he, Aristotle would distinguish in definitions between substantives and accidentals. And if you're defining something, if you're defining a book and whether the book is green or how many pages it has would be considered an accidental. It doesn't change the idea that it's a book. But the terms that are necessary for defining the book become the substantives for the definition. And this has been transferred to textual work. So that if there's a change in, the, in a manuscript or an edition, if you add an a, uh, if you change a present tense to a past tense, you put an ed on the end of a verb, this is a substantive change. But if you decide that you're going to spell labor, L-A-B-O-U-R, instead of L-A-B-O-R, this is an accidental. It doesn't change the actual words, just the form. So he gets to decide. And this actually is common practice for typesetters. Um, that they will decide the spelling, the punctuation. He, there was really no punctuation in the uh, manuscripts that he got. Capitalization, paragraphing, it was all one big paragraph, and italics. He decided that at the beginning of certain books and in the middle of some books, there was a little statement that told what was going to follow, a sort of summary. And I, I call them prefaces, but in any event, he decided to put them in italics. And so that was his decision. Um, I would point out here that um, some people have uh, said that the scribes used the kind of standard spelling because you could, you could find it somewhere. But this is not the case. The scribes don't have standard spelling. They are making lots of spelling errors, we would call them. They have lots of variation in them. Uh, but the typesetter would have had a dictionary that derives from Samuel Johnson's 1755 dictionary. It was a two-volume, huge work, a masterpiece. And uh, they weren't using his big dictionary, but they there were there were uh, dictionaries that were built upon his. They took all his wonderful citations from literature out and they just put the definitions. And, um, and so there were lots of these dictionaries being published and every press basically had these. So they, they would basically set standard spelling. Okay, now that's a big introduction, but it'll show up over and over again as we talk about these things. Now, um, one of the interesting aspects of the 1830 edition is that we have a form of the 1830 which is quite primitive. And these are the Wilford Wood uncut sheets. Now, the 1830 uh, Book of Mormon, this is a facsimile edition, not a real one, so it's not worth stealing. But 
it would have 16 page sections that they printed. They call, we call them signatures today. In, in printing at least, they call them signatures and they're 16 pages. And to make the Book of Mormon, there were 37 of these. And they would be printed on large sheets that will be folded and prepared so that a group of one through 37 would go into a particular copy. And I have brought, to give you an idea of what they would have been printing off. And this would be, this is the first signature, and here you can see it down here at the beginning, the Book of Mormon. And there would have been all 16 pages on this side. And when they printed, they would first print all this, and then later they would go back and they would turn it and print 16 again. Now if you do the turn right, you'll get, when you get done, you'll have two copies and then they will cut it. So they will end up with two individual copies with the proper eight on one side and the proper eight on the other. So when you get done, you have half sheets and the uncut sheets of Wilford Wood are basically 37 uncut sheets, one for each signature. And this is a mock-up of that. And so you would have this half sheet and you fold it, you fold it right, you get this and this part is all connected and will go into the binding and stitched in along with 36 more behind it. Notice this is folded, and if you're going to make a book, you've got to cut it. You've got to cut here and here, and they'll cut the bottom two to make it even. So he's got, Wilford Wood got from a banker, and apparently this collection of 37 sheets were kept originally by John Gilbert, and the family then sold them used and so forth, and the banker had them. And Wilford Wood, who is a collector, and we've met him last time, he comes from Bountiful, and he would go back every year several times and buy Mormonabilia and so forth, and he bought the 37 uh, uncut sheets. So he was probably told, I think, that the, un the collection of these sheets were the first ones that came off the press. This is not the case. In fact, when we look at the 37, 36 of them we can tell, not fully 36, but most of the 36 are defective sheets. In fact, the one that we have here that we've photographically reproduced from the uncut sheets has got a corner missing. Somehow it had been torn off and the, the people doing the press work said, well, we're not gonna put that in a Book of Mormon. So they were setting aside bad half sheets and they decided, I guess, we'll have a collection you know, of, of these. So most of those 37 are actually defective. Although if you look at a given copy, most of them are okay, but Every so often there's something, it got scraped. The, they didn't put enough ink on, so you get a whole area that's sort of very weak. And the reason I bring this up is people have accused the 1830 printer of sabotaging the 1830 edition. Now, if you're going to sabotage the edition, do you pull out bad sheets? No, just put them in there. And I've examined very closely over a hundred copies and I have never found any of the kinds of problems that are in the uncut sheets. But Wilford Wood advertised these sheets as being the first ones coming off. This is not true either. They aren't the first sheets and the reason we can tell is that when they started doing press work, they go through several stages. After they've set the type, they make a few copies, and these are called proof sheets. 
and that one of the proof sheets goes to one of the scribes, like Oliver Cowdery, and he will check it against his manuscript that he brought in to see if they said it right. Then the typesetter himself will be going through the sheet looking for typos and the accidentals. Did he make mistakes and so forth? And he, then they will go into the proof and correct it and they're ready to start the press work. They're going to produce 5,000 impressions. Now, about 10% of the way through, they will stop the press very often. And they're going to make in-press corrections. What is happening is that the typesetter is sitting there and he's deciding to go through it again and see if he can find other errors in his accidentals. And he does very often. So you have the others you can have when you have a, a given, given half sheet like this. It could be one side of it could be uncorrected and other side corrected. Or both sides are corrected. You don't have the, the, the case that they're, they're mixed the other way. But in any event, we, as we go through them, we find that his have uncorrected and corrected sometimes, and most of the time, all corrected. And if they're the first ones coming off, you would have many more uncorrected ones. So we know that how Wilford Wood viewed this isn't quite correct. But he produced a Book of Mormon called Joseph Smith Begins His Work. And he says that he took the uncut sheets and reproduced them exactly as they were. He knows he's not telling the truth because he's got bad sheets. That one with the corner missing, the one in here has got the corner. <laughs> and his family had other, co he had other copies of the 1830. And we can identify, actually by looking at the details on a page, we can say, oh yes, that's, that's Wilford Wood copy number one. This is Wilford Wood copy number two. When he had a scraped or smeared ink or any of these cut sheets, he used good sheets. Well, that's smart, but you, what has he created here then? He's created a sort of mixture from different copies. But there was a worse thing that he did. He had some guy go through in the photographic plates that they had and clean up the punctuation and he made mistakes. He changed the punctuation. And in one place, as we shall see right down here on page 218, the last line, the person doing this, the those, the O was only, the ink wasn't good, so it was only partially there, and he thought it was an E, so he made it into an E. So the guy messing around with the plates made an impress change. If you, over a hundred years later. But it was originally identified accidentally as an impress change. Now, you may think, okay, well, so what? So what? Well, some of you have gone out and bought facsimile editions. Not maybe this one, but other ones. And guess what? People don't like to make photographic reproductions of their real 1830. Might ruin the binding. So you get one of these and you tear it apart and you photograph each one and you reproduce it. So if you have a facsimile edition, you might check it out to see whose it really is. Now, you may have one that the church did. I don't have the churches here. This is one done by the RLDS. This one is page for page their copy, number 26. And they reproduced it but they goofed up a little bit. Sometimes the page number doesn't show up and it is in the actual copy because I went and checked it. So there's a second facsimile edition that's out there and sometimes people use this one. 
And in fact, most facsimile editions come from either the Wilford Wood one or the RLDS one, including R1980. It's in a yellow cover. Maybe some of you have it. I have a few. And so they're not, they're, they're, they're lying. <laughs> it's a polite way to say that they know what they're doing and they may not be fully aware of the problems. So, you know, you have to be careful of a law. Even buying an original, you have to be careful because there, sometimes it's two copies of the 1830 incomplete have been combined to create a new copy so you can sell it because that, that has happened too. Well, <laughs> so here we have his, his half sheet and here's what it really looks like and you can see right here, there's the cut. Notice the first leaf is really pretty de badly damaged and he didn't use that either. Now, this is, there, there, this is a proof sheet, the title page. This was the first thing printed from the Book of Mormon. At late August, after they had signed the agreement, Joseph Smith and others went to the press and they set the title page. And this is the proof sheet, one of the proof sheets. And they ran off copies just of the proof sheet and they handed them out to people. Joseph got one. We don't, as far as I know, we don't have his copy. This was a guy by the name of Harding. Is it Stephen? Yeah, Stephen Harding right down here. And he later became the territory, one of the territorial governors of Utah. He was there. A lot of important people there that day. And, uh, but in, 19, in 1847, he gave his copy to Brigham Young, to the church. And so we have, this as far as I know, the only one that exists of this. And I have marked in here, though, typos, junior. And some of these are just obvious typos. And you'll also notice that the, what we call the letting or the, the spacing is going to be different when they actually get done with the 1830, when they're going to run it off. And so the next one shows that. And that's the way it really looks. And this is a rather nice copy that's in Southern Methodist, coming from Southern Methodist University. And they have one on uh, a, a CD, and it's pretty, it's really clean. They went page by page. I think it's the best one that I've seen, but I have not examined the actual copy. So I just give you a warning. If you really want to make sure, you got to go look at the actual copy and compare it. But it does, it is a pretty good one uh, that exists. Okay. Oops, I don't want that. And here is something that I do whenever I have a chance to look at a copy that's in the public, so to speak. I don't like to do this with private copies. Make an examination of the impress changes. But this is the one that is on that CD of Southern Methodist University. And you'll notice in the 22nd signature up here, on the recto, which would be the right side of the eight pages on the right side, there are 341, 340, and 352 are these three errors. And they caught them. And if we examine enough copies, we can figure out, well, maybe they went about 10% of the way or 20% of the way before they decided to stop. There was one place where they stopped five times. One of the signatures, they stopped five times. So there are six states. An uncorrected one completely, and then they must have, you know, they fixed it, and then they started running, the guy's looking, John Gilbert's looking, oh, no, another one, stop it. And they, they do, and uh, so they did it that many times. This is a sign they really are do, trying their best. If you don't care, you're not going to stop once. And they are doing their best. And you can notice here there are some of these, 28, 23, 24. We don't have any evidence yet of copies that were in uncorrected and incorrected. Now, that doesn't mean... They're not out there, but 
you know, you just have to examine these kinds of things. Okay. Uh, one other thing I should point out is in the collection of 37, the last one in Wilford Wood's uncut sheets is a proof sheet, I think. If it's got all these errors in typos and various things and punctuation, and every copy I've examined isn't, doesn't have the uncorrected. It's all, they're all corrected. That's a sign that's probably a proof sheet. So when they got to the 36, they had already piled up, and they, and they got to the end, the last one, they just took that 37th one and just put the proof sheet in their pile. So the last one's a proof sheet. So if you look at this book, it's got a proof sheet. Now you may like proof sheets because it means it's the uncorrected state. You can't go out and find an 1830 that's got all corrected states or that it's got uncorrected in a large amount. They're usually running from about three to six of them. Three to six of the sides are like this. And the rest of them are in incorrect, incorrect states. I have never found any two 1830s which are identical. They are all that I've seen different. So if you have a copy, there's probably some special aspect to it. Maybe we would find that there's a, a sixth time they stopped in that one signature, because you will have something in between. Okay. You know, okay, it's a lot of detail, right? But the point of this is that these guys were accused in our church history because they had typos that they were trying to cheat Joseph Smith. No, they are trying to do their best. Now, we will see somebody later who is trying to cheat Brigham Young and got away with it. It's coming. Okay, the second edition is the one done in 1837, and it is really known for editing, and it's mostly Joseph Smith doing editing, and the, it's grammatical editing. So he removed several thousand, or he made several thousand editorial changes, and the most common kind of change is to get rid of King James English that had become archaic. And the most common one of all is 952 times that he changed which to who or whom. There are a few he changed to that, but that was not too often. So the most famous one would be our father, which art in heaven in third Nephi. And it's which in the 1830, but in the 1837, it's who. So we get two forms, a corrected one in grammar and other. He did this 952 times. But when he got down to, when he was doing this, when he went, got to 2 Nephi 18, he stopped doing it for a while. It's probably because he was in the Isaiah portions, and Isaiah is King James, so he was more willing to accept it. And as soon as he got through 24, 2 Nephi 24, he's into 25, he kept the witches all the way to Jacob 5. Didn't change any of them except a couple that were brought out quite clearly that he ought to. But so you end up with a mix. His editing is not consistent. Uh, one of the things that we note, he was going along when he did this. He was apparently going through the printer's manuscript, reading it out loud, or maybe Oliver had the 1830 copy and they were checking it. And the 1830 copy, Oliver's gonna mark up because that's the one they're gonna take to the press. And you have to remember that no Book of Mormon's been set for manuscript except the first edition, because it's too hard. You don't wanna use handwriting, you wanna use a printed edition. So they took the 1830 in to do the 1837, and this they called it. We call this the copy text. Which edition are you using 
to as your copy and you're going to mark it up to whatever you're going to do with it so but Joseph was going through the printers at this time the manuscript because they were checking and he marked of those 952 he marked 732 in the manuscript but some of them aren't they're just in the 1837 we don't have that 1830 that Oliver was marking up and took to the press and we usually don't when the printer gets done his printer's inks all over this thing it's all marked up they throw them away shouldn't keep them we like to see what went on because sometimes we're not sure who really made the change in the 1837 if it isn't marked in the printers is it Oliver or is it Joseph telling Oliver to do it or is it even the printer so sometimes we would like to have that copy okay one of the interesting aspects of the 1837 is for about first Nephi Joseph engaged in the text more than with grammar he made stylistic changes he stopped doing it though and this is characteristic of Joseph Smith he'll have energy to do something extra for a while and then he'll quit you know if a mob was chasing you you'd quit too usually the exigencies of being the president of the church and all the things he had to deal with he would stop and one of the things we see in the 1837 is him making stylistic I think stylistic changes phrases that he just wanted to rephrase them in ways that he felt might be better and this is I think one of those now it's originally reads first D 5 11 18 the virgin which thou seest is the mother of God and that's the way it is in the critical text the mother of God uh, he changed it to the mother of the Son of God that's what your current text reads this is a change by Joseph Smith in April of 1835 we quoted from a friend of truth and those are scare quotes <laughs> from the pioneer we were quoting in our church Latter-day Saint messenger and advocate a complaint about this passage the name of Jesus Christ was declared to Nephi 545 years before it was announced to Mary as if God can't do this <laughs> he told Mary in advance that was nine months <laughs> and she in true Roman phraseology is called the mother of God a Catholic phrase so I think Joseph Smith reacted to this and he changed it to the son of God we don't want the Book of Mormon to be a Catholic tract I don't think it's a Trinitarian statement but there's been a lot of ink shed over this kind of editing Joseph Smith revising his thinking on the Trinity and so forth. no I think he just reacting to the Catholic sounding phraseology he did it for three more passages I think I have them here maybe I'd oops this thing is a tricky no okay but there are three others in the next couple chapters where he puts in son of and then he stops doing it so that when you get later on in the Book of Mormon it'll refer to Christ as the Father you know and God and so forth and there's no attempt to change any of these and so I look at it as a stylistic thing I think it's something that has not been considered and we need to consider it in terms of interpreting this it isn't I don't think a revision of the Mormon view of the of the Trinity okay um, the 1840 edition as I pointed out is in Cincinnati and Nauvoo it's the first stereotyped edition a stereotype what they do is they set the type they make a mold usually out of paper mache in those days and correct me Larry and they'd have this mold and then they pour lead for each page they do this and they'll create a single piece of lead for the whole page and that's a stereotype 
They can correct these by gouging out the lead and putting actual type in. If you're going to do that, do it while you're in the original printing shop so you have type that looks like what you have. If you do it later, you usually don't have the font and you put something else in and it looks, I think, awful is probably the right word. Okay, but they didn't do that here. They, they, didn't, they didn't correct these plates and uh, they, they gave the first printing to Ebenezer Robinson and uh, then it, uh, this edition though, it's important to realize it had some extra editing by Joseph Smith. Not as much as the 1837, but he's still got some editing and he's going to make two significant changes in the text. Um, okay, so, so one of them is in 1st Nephi 20 and 1, in quoting Isaiah, it referring to O house of Jacob and so forth and are come forth out of the waters of Judah. And that's the original that would have been in the 1830 and the 1837. And Ebenezer Robinson said Joseph Smith put this extra phrase in or out of the waters of baptism. In the 1840 edition, though, it's in parentheses. This is important, it turns out, because I think it's an indication of Joseph Smith saying, this is a comment, this is a marginal note, this is what I think it could be referring to. In any event, we will later see in the 1920 edition, they discovered this reading. Now, the, it, we'll talk about the textual tradition. Ours doesn't derive from the 1840, but the 1837. And so we discovered it, Talmadge discovered it, and decided he was going to put this in because obviously Joseph Smith, it's something he would have done. It seems like that seems right. And this is this committee copy, a 1911 edition called the 1920 committee copy with Talmadge's marking it up. And you will see here that he put in or out of the waters of baptism and he put the parentheses in at first. But later he came in with a pencil, red pencil, and took out the parentheses. And so if you look in the 1920 edition, the phrase is added, but there's no parentheses. So now people read this and they compare it to their Isaiah and they say, wow, look, the original Isaiah, which is in the Book of Mormon, had a reference to baptism. And oh, some evil Jewish scribe must have removed this only reference to baptism. It was there and they took it out. Now see, with the parentheses, there's some possibility you might think it's extra. But by removing this, it causes difficulty, I think. And if you don't believe that people have done this, there are important people in the history of our church who have made that interpretation, which I just stated, and you can go find them. I'm not going to tell you who it was. <laughs> the other one, this is still, the drums are beating on this one. White and delightsome. In 2 Nephi 30 and 6, this was changed, apparently by Joseph Smith, consciously to pure and delightsome. And many generations shall not pass away among them, save they shall be a white and delightsome people, is the way the printer's manuscript reads. It's the way the 1830, the 1837, but the 1840 reads pure. It doesn't look like it's an it's a typesetting error, a visual error. It's consciously done, I think. And in 1981, the Scriptures Committee decided because it was in the 1840 and it looked like it was Joseph Smith's emendation, and I think it is, they put it in. Unfortunately, this was a time when the church was dealing with racial issues. And so it looked like the church was trying to get rid of a reference of white being preferred and making it pure. And 
the ink is still flowing on this one. But I think there's a problem with it. And I think what occurred here is if you look at the other references in the Book of Mormon that, that prefer white skin, light skin over dark, they are there, there are eight of them, but they all refer to Lamanites. And there are cases where it says Lamanites will get light skin and so they're not changed or anything. This is the only one that's changed. Why is it the only one? If you're going to remove racism from the Book of Mormon, you know, you got a few other places you ought to work on. I don't think it was that. I think this is the only one that refers to the skin color of the descendants of our seed. That includes Nephi. And I think Joseph Smith, and I don't know, but I think, he looked at this and said, well, the Nephites, they're going to be light-skinned. How can they change to become white when they're already white? So he changes it to pure so it'll work in his mind. But if you read other places in the Book of Mormon, especially Alma 45, it says Nephites who join the Lamanites will become like them, will become dark-skinned. So that actually this will work. What you have to deal with is the problem of why he does this one and not on any of the others. This is the only one that refers to Nephites, potentially. So, in any event, the critical text puts back white. That's what it should be, from a textual point of view. Now, in a real world, we wish it might be different. But the Nephites had this view, especially since they weren't dark-skinned. <laughs> okay, we have two textual traditions. I've referred just briefly to it. One is the LDS that comes through the 1837. This is because when Brigham Young went to England, he wanted to publish a Book of Mormon there and eventually got permission from Joseph Smith. He took the only Book of Mormon of most recent printing that was available, the 1837. They were working on the 1840 in Cincinnati, but it's in the middle of things, so they can't take the 1840. He takes the 1837, and he goes to Liverpool, and he gets a printer, and he says, he hands him the copy, apparently. Unmarked, no editing, reprinted. And so the, the printer in Liverpool is going to do this, and basically with typos and everything, but he is going to uh, reprint it. Then there will be two other editions. Orson Pratt in 1849 will do the second one. And he uses as a copy text the 1841 with all those typos, turns out. And I would say a valiant attempt to remove the typos. He, he tried to consult the 1837 and get rid of, he got rid of most of them, but there's a few he didn't get and they're still in your text. The 1840 typesetter is still with us. <laughs> and then there's a third one, which we'll talk about here in a bit, the 1852 British, done in, uh, set it, the title page says Liverpool, back it says it was printed in London. Okay. Now the 1841 British edition, as I said, was directly typed from an unedited 1837. There are no intentional changes to the text. There's no editing. Brigham Young, is not an editor. It is the worst typeset edition. <laughs> if you want to find an edition where you can say these guys were cutting corners, this is the one. It is nicely bound though. They did some for the queen. It, when you see the copies, you think, oh, this is beautiful. And Elder Holland had one, Hiram Smith, remember in conference, he was holding it up? that Hiram had turned down the page before he went off to Carthage. It's one of these, and it looks good. And the, and the church news reported it as the best typeset Book of Mormon, which is not true. It's the worst. They didn't start reading it, okay? And 
One of the things you can see, the first, la first signatures, they just stop proofing. There are typos that if you just looked at the thing, you would say, oh my gosh. And they're, they're just so egregious that you have to say they aren't proofing the last several signatures. One of the things, Brigham, he got, he, he got several bids. We even have records of these bids. And these guys that he took said they could do it for 20% less. He took it. And he got about 20% less books. And he didn't know it because a week before the book appeared, the church published to its members that 5,000 copies would be available, but it turns out they only got about 4,100 or so. Because paper is actually the most expensive aspect. The other bids were true bids. These guys, I think, were intending to cheat Brigham Young from the beginning. And they and Brigham paid as they went, and I guess at the end they counted. But those guys went out of business in two years. And uh, we'll see, though, one of the little tricks coming up. So when you have a case of type, you buy the type, and there's certain amounts for English. And you got, you know, you got D's, you got E's, those are pretty common N's and so forth. You know, and other letters are less frequent, so there are fewer of them. And these guys were discovering as they were typesetting them, and they were due 16 pages, that they were running out of D's. So you could go out and buy some more type, right? But you can't just buy D's. You've got to buy the whole thing. So they don't want to do this. They, just, they realized they could do, use upside down P's. And when I first saw these, I thought, these are the weirdest D's. And Jonathan Salsa says, oh, they're just doing upside down P's. Well, let's look at them. Oops, I, this thing is really tricky, this weapon. So here's what a page looks like. And I have put in yellow places where there are the upside down P's. And you can see, this is not just random. They haven't just accidentally mixed their P's and their D's. They're deciding, we're going to now, we need, some, we need some extra D's. Let's pull these P's in. So they're doing it. And, uh, but you can search, we'll do it close up. Here it is. See these serifs? These are called serifs. A true D only goes over to the left, but an upside down P goes all the way across. Let's find a P in here. Here, see? All the way across. <laughs> so I call this cheating. <laughs> you know? They are not trying their best. And they are dece trying to deceive on the number of copies. I think it's pretty apparent. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a printer's hell. <laughs> Okay, the 1852 edition was set from the 1849. So that's its copy text. They're going to use Orson Pratt's. But they do a number of really interesting things. They, the paragraphs were originally set in the 1830 by John Gilbert. And at first, where it was narrative, he was, every time he'd get to an end, it came to pass that if it seemed like he hadn't heard it for a while, he'd make a new paragraph. So many of the paragraphs start out with, and it came to pass. But then it moved away from narrative, and you didn't get many of these, and he set several pages, just one big paragraph. And then he finally realized, oh, I've got I've to think of something else besides, and it came to pass. And he did. But n many of the paragraphs in the 1830 are very long, and so the the Franklin brothers, Franklin, or no, Richards, the Richards brothers, Franklin Richards and Samuel Richards, who did this, Franklin Richards was the mission president and apostle, and they broke up the paragraphs into reasonable lengths, and they numbered them. They numbered the paragraphs. This is the first versification, so to speak, but it's really better to say it's numbered paragraphs, because they're long. They're not what we're used to as verses, numbered verses. Um, they did one other thing which is quite striking 
And this is that after they made a stereotype and they produced the printing for that stereotype. And then they decided we're going to correct the stereotype. And they went through it and they would do it as 16 pages at a time for their for the second printing. And they went through and corrected in every instance the accidentals, the punctuation, spelling, and various things. But in some of the 16-page areas, they made corrections according to the 1840, the one that had been done in Cincinnati. And so sometimes they would make the change, but they didn't make, for instance, the two that we mentioned. They missed those. So you didn't get the pure and delightsome in in this edition, and you didn't get or out of the waters of baptism because they didn't look. But they made other ones that were in the 1840s, so it's a, it's a mix. Then they ran off a few copies of the corrected plates, and they had type right there in the 1852 shop in London, so they could, when you gouge them, it looks pretty good. You know, it's really hard to tell that they've actually corrected the plates. And they ran off apparently only a few copies. There are only two known copies. And it says, though, on the title page, you'd think it was actually the first printing. You have to go through it and you discover, wait, there's some changes in here. In fact, it's identical to the 1854 and all subsequent plates or uh, printings come from these corrected plates. But they did two copies. They sent one to Salt Lake. A guy named Campbell said, here, brethren, here's our work that we've been doing. And another one's in the Huntington. So if you're looking for a copy worth something, this is what you want to get. 1852, corrected. And uh, well, it's an interesting one for the corrections that were done and so forth. You see, one of the things you're discovering is what is really going on in the print shop? You can write a history of the print shop by getting books that tell you how they printed books in New York City. But you're going to be wrong because there are all these little other things that are taking place. And I prefer finding the actual evidence of what's taking place. The RLDS textual tradition. It actually derives from an 1858 James Wright edition published in New York. And I would say until recently, it's the finest printed Book of Mormon, printed. These are New York printers, and it looks really good. And um, James Wright belonged to a, a minor sect that had broken off from the church, but he didn't promote his book as a... Um, a religious book. He promoted it as a classic in American literature. <laughs> there you are, way back then. And uh, uh, but he couldn't. He didn't sell many copies. And actually, the sheets that he had just remained. They didn't bind them all at once. They'd be, you know, there. And so he sold them to a guy named um, Zadok Brooks who took out the first sheet and redid the whole introduction and made it an anti-Brigham Young tract. <laughs> so from an American classic to an anti-Brigham Young book. And it sold because RLDS people bought it. And eventually it was depleted, sold out, and so then the RLDS decided we're going to do our own. And so they have and um, they did the first one in Plano, Illinois, although some copies say it's in Lamoni. But this is, they just had these sheets and they, they didn't have them all bound and they shipped them off to Lamoni when they set that up and then they redid the title page. But the rest of it is original from an earlier period. Then they did a very interesting, in 1892, a large print edition and it's got columns. This is the first Book of Mormon with columns. Why do you do columns? Because in the time, scripture is done in two columns, so it looks like scripture. The King James Bible is done in columns. 
And so that's what they adopted. They actually later, in their later editions, abandoned the double column. But the large print, they had it. The 1908 RLDS is extremely important. One of the most important editions because in five years earlier, the RLDS church purchased the printer's manuscript from George Schweik, the grandson of David Whitmer. And they went through it pretty carefully and made changes to the text which don't appear in our LDS edition until 1981. But that's because then we had access to the printer's manuscript. I don't think it was because we were going through their 1908. But this edition is an important one for restoring many early readings in the text. And then there's a more recent one for them, probably their last one. Well, they have a 1966, a member, uh, the secretary to their first presidency did an updated version. No nays, no yays, get rid of the TH endings, all the biblical stuff, very modern. It's sort of interesting to look at. This is what we call a stemma. You can see the two textual traditions. So this is the RLDS going down to 1953. This is very interesting. I haven't figured it out totally, but it looks like when they set the first edition, they sometimes used that um, right edition, and they sometimes used the 1840. When they were typesetting, they sometimes they got two copies in the print shop. They're mixing it. It's really... Weird. It's the only one like this. And here on the other side, we have the LDS. Notice, see, our 1841 comes from this. So we get two traditions. This means the 1981 is set from the 1920. And we have a little bit more here we're going to mention here in a minute. Okay. The most innovative LDS edition is 1879. And this is done by Orson Pratt, printed in Liverpool to save money. They made two stereotype plates, sets. One of them he brought back with him to Salt Lake so they could print copies in Salt Lake. And the other one they left in England to print copies there. The ones in the US, they use more and they deteriorate fast. And, some, and they were damaged too in transport, some of the plates. And so they had to put new type in and it looks just repulsive. <laughs> you love the text, but you don't want to read it. <laughs> so, um, in, but what's really striking about this is the LDS chapter and verse system, which we are familiar with. He took that 1852 with the numbered big paragraphs, and the it was based on the original chapter system that was in the Book of Mormon. We talked about this last time. They were longer chapters. They were based on narration. He broke them up into thematic ones. And uh, he basically wanted to have no more, no, not get up to 100 verses for a given chapter, but have them look like biblical ones, not too long and so forth. And so he broke up chapters. In most cases, he kept the major chapter breaks the same, but sometimes he shifted them a little bit. Um, one of the really interesting aspects, which has caused us to misinterpret it, is the Isaiah portions are the chapters which were narrative-based. Like all those, that a big Isaiah portion has three original chapters, and they're all cohesive. But in the King James Bible, they're broken up in all these little chapters, and of course he breaks them all up. And it makes you think even more, this has been copied from a King James Bible, because it's literally fine. But the original text is not following a King James Bible as it was formatted, even though the text is based on the King James Bible. And so there's sometimes the way we formatted the text will make us misconceive the, uh, way, the way that we should perceive the text. Um, 
one of the interesting ones is he's trying to make the verses agree with the King James. He, there, the church history department has three copies of from the 1852 corrected plates. One is 54, 74, 76. That's when they were printed. He went through each of those copies and put in his new system. Now this is diligence. And he took one of the copies with him to England. And the one is the third copy and we can tell he took it because it's got all the printer fingerprints and ink all over this thing. And he made a mistake. In that one copy alone, oops, gosh, I'm not good at this. Where am I? There you go. So in this one part, he should have put the 27 here, Isaiah 5, but he put it down here. And you can see why his eye skipped down. But he only did it to this copy. Didn't do it to the other two, but he took this one. Well, hoop de doo It means the versification's off. But only here, but it's off. You see the hands, no matter how, he's trying his best, but there's still little errors that come in. They just happen. It is human transmission of the text. And one of the points I've been making, I'll repeat it again, as far as I can tell, there's only one stage where the Lord's controlling the transmission of the text. And that's what Joseph Smith is given through the instrument. Everybody else has got to do their best to try and transmit it, and you'll get tired, your eye will skip, these kinds of things will occur. Okay. He, one of the other things that he did was to put in footnotes in two types. Scriptural references. They are so good. Well, we'll have to compare them with the 2013. There's a reason for comparing them. I'll talk about that. But James Talmadge in the 1920 virtually car carried them across with hardly any changes. And they were done by Orson Pratt. He thought through every one of them. He didn't have a computer to just grind out examples that had the same word in them, okay? Uh, but the more interesting thing was that he put in content footnotes. They were all removed in the 1920. Now, these are really interesting ones. Some of them are geographical, like 1 Nephi 1823. There's a footnote, and it says, believed to be on the coast of Chile, South America. This is based on a statement that Frederick G. Williams said, that Joseph Smith said, that this is where they landed. So you you get this in the text. It's a it's a two continent geography. The narrow neck of land is Panama and so forth. That's his model. And but the other ones are doctrinal of sorts. And so here we have Ether one and forty one that says the brother of Jared has families. Wow, that's just what you need. <laughs> so Orson Pratt, who preached the first public defense of polygamy, has from this verse, it is seen that the brother of Jared had a plurality of families. So that was right there. This became very controversial. And the reason it's controversial, the RLDS, when they got the printer's manuscript, discovered that it read family. And the typesetter accidentally set families because he was a secret polygamist. <laughs> no, no. What happened was the line below talks about the brother of Jared and his friends and their families. So his eyes skipped down to the plural, one line below, and he accidentally put in the plural. It's still in your text, but it's a mistake. Okay. The 1905 missionary edition is interesting because it was done by a mission president. He got permission from Joseph F. Smith, and I have a copy of it, one of them. So they made it small, and you know, you can, even good investigators give this out. 
And so this was published in Chicago. German Ellsworth basically didn't do much with the first printing in 1905. They did 10,000 copies in each time, 1905, 1906. 1907, he went into the plates, had the type still, because he's in Chicago, and he corrected them, how he felt. And one of the corrections is quite interesting. So it says, yea, it shall come in a day when the power of God shall be denied and churches become defiled and shall be lifted up in the pride of their hearts. Yea, in a day when leaders of churches and teachers in the pride of their hearts. Period. That's the way the, that's the, way the printer's manuscript reads. And German Ellsworth thought, I think there's a mistake, there's something missing here, and so he added the words, shall rise. They sh leaders of churches and teachers shall rise in the pride of their hearts. I myself think that it should be, shall be lifted up, because you see it up here, churches become defiled and shall be lifted up in the pride of their hearts. And you can debate whether this is what we call an ellipsis, intended to be omitted, or whether it was just an actual omission, accidental error. I think it was the latter myself, because you don't have these kinds of ellipses in the Book of Mormon text. In any event, he made the change. Mission presidents can change the text, and it's still with us. It's in your 2013. Okay. The 1920 edition is also a very innovative one. Basically, I think Talmage is the moving force here, although there is a committee, so we could say it was the committee. But uh, it was printed back in Hammond, Indiana. I always remember reading that as a kid and wondering, my, why well, go all the way back to Hammond to do this? But they did. It introduced for the Latter-day Saints the two-column version of reading the text. And I think there's a problem with the two column, particularly in ours, because they're so narrow, they make it hard to read, actually. You have to break words and phrases and concentrate. It takes considerable energy to read a narrow two column, but it looks like scripture. And it is true you can find a passage to quote with little verses. Each verse is a little paragraph. So there's citational reasons, and this dates back to the 1550s or so with the Geneva Bible and other ones. The Geneva Bible was noted for wanting a citation Bible with notes and so forth. Um, but he did many other things that are interesting. He put chapter summaries in. Earlier there were some listings of content. We'll talk about those. Um, and he removed all the content footnotes that Orson Pratt had written. He put a pronouncing vocabulary at the end. We've kept that kind of thing going, revise it every so often. He put in an index, and he put dates in, but he didn't originate dates. There are two large print editions done in 1888, 1906 by us in Salt Lake, and they have dates. And they were more for Sunday school. That's why the dates were probably put in there, to help people uh, read it. Okay. There's careful editing. Talmage uh, makes a lot of corrections, uh, things that he thinks doesn't read very well and so forth. And so he uh, does quite a bit of editing. Now, I think we can say it is Talmage. I can't prove it's Talmage, but that committee copy is marked up by him. And, uh, and conversations he had with people seems to indicate he was in charge of, of more or less the text itself. Uh, he looked at the 1830 or 1840 editions or had secretaries poring over them trying to find differences. Um, his editing is, I think, fairly pedantic. Some of it really not necessary, but he is a stickler for good grammar. Um, okay, how do you, can you tell you have an actual 1920? You have to look... You have to look for the Connaught edition. There's one typo. 
it escaped his eagle eye. <laughs> and so the first printing has a Connaught, and it's fun to look at it. Oops, this is trigger happy. Okay, there it is. C-O-N-N-O-T, and I guess when he found it, well, I would have liked to have been in his office. <laughs> Knowing Tally, he was, you know, you've heard the story of him trying to bicycle across the board and all this, you know. I mean, I could just imagine what his, the day, it ruined his day. But it got corrected in the second printing. But if you have one, and I was in DI and found this, and they didn't know they didn't know it was a Connaught edition. <laughs> 35 cents. <laughs> My best buy. So, in any event. Okay. The 1981 LDS edition is not really that innovative, but it is a revision of the 1920. And I think we need to keep that in mind as we look at it. Um, there were revisions in the format with the chapter summaries, the pronunciation guide, the indexed. Uh, we added topical guide references in the footnotes. Numbers uh, for different people is something new. You would say Nephi 1, 2, and how many ever there are. And they will be, though, only in the index. They won't be in the text itself or in the summaries. They, they are sort of obscured, and that's probably okay. And the real problem probably is the excessive computer-generated scriptural references. And so many of them, you look them up, and you find that it's just another scripture with the same word, but it's not really relevant. My understanding is, we can go check it online, the 2013 has a much reduced and appropriate relevant scriptural cross-referencing, ones that have been checked by us humans. Uh, they were checked by humans then, but they let too many through, I think, that um, you, you can't have too many footnotes, references, because you will stop using them. They've got to be ones that are germane and helpful if, you, if, if you're going to have them. Okay. Uh, they used the manuscripts for the 1981 as much as possible. And the early editions, 1830 and 1840, are the two that are typically used a lot. Now, non-church editions. Beginning in about the last 15 years, we've had quite a few non-church editions, not identified with the church or the RLDS church. The The first one I want to mention here is the Restored Covenant Edition. This actually is the first edition to print some of the findings of the Critical Text Project and readings that have been discovered as part of this project. Uh, I do not own the readings that have been found, and I've insisted that I do not own them. I'm not taking out copyright on the newly discovered readings. It is available, those readings, to be used by people. And so Shirley Heater, a, an RLDS member, and uh, Zarahemla Research Foundation took some of my work and her own work and so forth and produced this edition. It has a kind of uh, what she wanted to call poetic lines. And in true Protestant tradition, Words of Christ in red. This is over in the in the uh, the exhibit. You can see this version. Uh, it's quite an interesting version. Uh, Restored Covenant edition is sort of loaded. Uh, when I was working on my edition with Yale, they suggested that I subtitle it the Restored Text. And oh, that for LDS, restored is really loaded. So, no. Okay. So the next one here is the first actual, with my cooperation, production of the critical text that was being produced. And it is a letterpress 
that is actual set type of the allegory of the olive tree done by Rob Buchert of Trist Press here in Provo. And this in, so here's actual set type, individually set and pressed. He made 50 copies and he illuminated, that is painted, each copy individually by hand. As with these kinds of things, the typesetting doesn't take too long, but the illumination takes forever. It's, it's the part that, that costs. This is the critical text in most instances, except he did not want the bad grammar. The original text has bad grammar. So I, the editor, had to become a real editor and correct the bad grammar because he's selling this to people who don't want to read they was. <laughs> if you pay enough for your Book of Mormon, you don't want to read it. So I gave in. And um, anyway, it's, it's still a very important work and just uh, presenting a beautiful version of the Book of Mormon. And uh, that also is over, uh, you can see it in the exhibit. Okay, the next one is uh, in the Penguin Classics. So we are back to the Book of Mormon as literature. Uh, Laurie Maffley Kipp doing in 2008 the Book of Mormon. And this, if you open it up, is in the typical style, the font, the formatting that Penguin is famous for in its, its series of literature. The only reservation I, she took, the only reservation I have is when she took the 1840 text, she decided I'm gonna use the 1840 text because that's the last one Joseph Smith worked on. And that's fine. But then she decided she had to sometimes correct the accidentals where there were errors. And it's sort of a mix. Sometimes she leaves typos and sometimes she corrects typos. And I finally realized, I think she just goofed. <laughs> you know, she sometimes caught them and did, corrected them, sometimes didn't catch them and left them. I don't know, you know, I haven't really asked her. But it. It looks pretty good. It has those, it has the long paragraphs and various, the original chapters and so forth. So you can get in the Penguin series, the Book of Mormon. And there's a Broadway play, but that isn't really relevant. <laughs> okay. The reader, there are three now that I want to talk, which are more significant. The first one is a reader's edition done by Grant Hardy. And this really was the first edition of the Book of Mormon that you could go into Barnes and Noble and buy it. A trade edition that's there on the shelves, published by the University of Illinois. And Grant, when he did this, wanted to make this book like the Protestant and Catholic Bibles that you see today. Not like the King James, originally narrow to column, but paragraphs, headers, minor footnotes. In his case, he didn't want a lot. Some of the NIV ones are just loaded. You know, I don't really like too much of that. But it's a very nicely set out text. And it's what we expect today from modern Bibles. So he is sort of following in the idea we ought to make the Book of Mormon look like what people expect. Now maybe not for us LDS, but for non-LDS. This is how scripture now looks. He will set some lines in uh, poetry. So if it looks sort of poetic, he will do it. And you, if you go look at some of the Bibles, they will do Isaiah, parts of Isaiah this way and so forth. So it's very much falling in that. One of the problems he had was that, well, there's also quotation marks. He decided on quotation marks. And it's okay, but there's a problem with the Book of Mormon text. You get quotes within quotes within quotes. And after a while, when you see three and four quote mark, you know, single, double, single, double, 
it, you know, it's just not fun. Okay. And the other problem was uh, he could not use the 1981 text. He wasn't permitted. So he used the 1920. And then he keyed it in. We'll talk about keying in a text. He types it in. You make mistakes when you type in a text. So there are a few errors. Well, what else do you expect? Okay. Um, he has numbers for people. He puts his down sub numbers instead of raised numbers. Uh, he puts them, though, in the headers sometimes. It looks a little funny, I think, in the headers. Actually, within the text, you'll see the numbers. And um, so I mentioned the other two things. Okay, this is what it looks like. And there you can see that two, which sort of bothers me. Jacob II's address. But he will tell you various things, original chapter breaks and other kinds of notes. It is a reader's edition. The idea is to help the reader deal with the text. Okay. The Doubleday edition. This is an important edition for Latter-day Saints. And you may not have known it, but we're going to talk about it. So when Grant Hardy's book came out in 2003, people suddenly could get a Book of Mormon in Barnes and Noble. And I, now the rest of mine is conjecture, but I'm pretty sure the church approached Doubleday to provide them our standard text to publish it under Doubleday, not under the name of the church. And so this is what was produced. 2004, our church even announced it. Elder Iring at the time says this is the authorized text. So it is the church's text. And um, this is important with respect to our 2013. And that's an important point that I want to make here. So it was provided by the church. It is now a trade edition, $25. The church did not encourage you to buy this. How many of you have this? Okay, a few of you. How many of you have the regular LDS text? <laughs> Come on, some of you aren't raising your hands. <laughs> okay, so it isn't. It hasn't been encouraged. Twenty-five dollars. You know, they never. I don't think it's in paperback. Do you? I don't know. Any event. Okay, but it's very important for the history of the LDS text now. Um, so it's a trade edition. The footnotes are all removed. I sort of like that. No footnotes. Do we have it here? I think we do. The chapter summaries are retained, but they have been revised. And there's a lot of news recently about the Book of Mormon ones, but we've already gone over these. The Tribune already had a bunch of articles about these revisions. And I think it's fine to revise them uh, because they're not canonical and you can represent what's in the chapters as you wish. And uh, they made many of them that were more correct in terms of what's actually in there, and I'll talk about one of them. But they also took away some of the racial tension, I would call it, that were in the original ones that were written by Elder McConkie. They are in there, and you can compare the ones in the double day. And as far as I can tell, the new edition that came out has followed these. Okay. There is a pronunciation guide. It's been revised. One of the interesting things is Zenik, which was originally C-H, in the, in the pronunciation guide spelled with a C-H, which is correct. But the text has CK, but in the double day, they finally got it straight, but wrong. <laughs> they put in CK in the pronunciation guide. Oh. So it's fun. 
Okay, but there is something really interesting in this book, and I don't think it's probably in the new one. I haven't really checked. It's a reference guide to the Book of Mormon. Really some helpful minor, you know, things like Jesus Christ, appearance and ministry to the inhabitants of the Americas, the atonement, the church, birth and death, Jehovah, the key passages in the Book of Mormon that refer to it. To me, this would be actually very helpful to do in, you know, if you wanted to do a topic study uh, of the Book of Mormon. And it was oriented towards non-members, obviously, but I think we could benefit from it too. So I, I recommend, there are lots of interesting things. This text, uh, I like its openness, uh, the, the, what we call the letting or the spacing between the lines is more open. We still have the double columns, we have the verses, each verse is a, is a paragraph and so forth. But it doesn't look as cluttered, maybe I shouldn't use that word, but with all the, you know, you have all the references, it, you, you notice the references. Here, it's the text. So there are some nice things I think the church did, and the church did it. I think we really have to say this is the church's edition. Okay, what are the changes in this edition, 2004? Well, there's minor revising, as I mentioned, the chapter and summaries, introductions, especially on how the Lamanites are interpreted. They're updated. One of the most important updates is Nephite coinage. Alma 11 is no longer that, it's the Nephite monetary system. Because the text itself doesn't say coins. They're measures of weight and equivalents. It is a monetary system, and most monetary systems start out this way, not as fiat money, not as greenbacks, but as actual commercial items which can be transferred. In any event, uh, people have criticized us for saying you have coins and no coins were in America until the Spaniards came and so forth. And the text itself actually supports its, it, itself in the sense that it doesn't have coins. So we've taken it out. We paid attention to this complaint and it was appropriate. Um, it's found in the earlier chapter summaries. It's found originally in table of contents that were put in the first editions. The first four editions are really hard to use. Actually the fifth, the one by 1849. Because you just have these long chapters and you say, oh, where's, where can I read about Korhor? You gotta just go flipping through till you finally see Korhor. There's no headers, there's no, there's nothing to really help you. So Saints right in the beginning actually, well pretty much I think 1841 was the actual first one, maybe wrong, but they, they printed a, the contents, sort of a, you know, you could, it's sort of like a table of contents, and they would glue them in, tip them in they call it, into your book. And you can find 1830s out there for sale with the tipped in 1830 uh, table of contents. It's not original to the text, but it probably increases the value for, for, for people buying it. Okay, and all of those early ones, including two indexes in those two large print ones, they had table of, or it's not indexes, in their table of contents, they had also this reference to coins. It wasn't that Talmage made it up. A lot of people think he made it up. No, it's the traditional interpretation. Here they are, or here's actually the, the first page of the index to the 1830s. So you can see what it's like. References to the Book of Mormon, first book. It just goes through in order. There was one they did where they organized it by subject, but otherwise that's sort of like an, an actual index. But the others were done as table of contents. Okay, now, so Nephite coinage. 1830 actually would have worked, names of money. But everybody else referred to them as coinage until 2000, oops, I'm not really good at this, sorry. So 2004, the Nephite monetary system is set forth and 2013 has it this way. And the one on the church website has got it wrong. 
They, they say they're correct. They, they, they use the 1981 and they say it reads the ne Nephite coinage is set forth. They actually use the old reading, but human beings are doing this. <laughs> we make mistakes. Okay, but there it is. We now have the Nephite monetary system. And so the brethren have become very concerned about trying to make this accurate and more neutral, you know, not as maybe politically offensive. And I think it's, it's fine. Uh, one of the big changes, I suppose, one that Dan Ludlow fought for years to get into our scriptures is to get the punctuation right in Moroni 3 and 3. And maybe you have noticed this too. So the actual way it reads in the 1981 is the parenthesis is too early. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ordain you to be a priest. And it should read this way. Or if he be a teacher, I ordain you to be a teacher. But earlier, all the way back to the 1830 typesetter, he made a mistake. He put the parenthesis too early. So it says, or if you be a teacher, I ordain you to be a teacher. So, but it, it, you know, it doesn't read that way. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ordain you to be a priest. I ordain you to be a teacher, to preach repentance. I mean, that's the way it reads. So it is a mistake. Dan Ludlow worked for years. I think he complained in Costco to me about it and, <laughs> and so forth. <laughs> when are they going to change this? They did, 2004. They quietly moved the punctuation. Okay. Uh, it's now in the right place. Okay. These are four more changes that were made in the 2004. Now they are listed online as if they were made in 2013, but they were made in 2004. So we're up to five changes. Here they are. These are called substantive changes. Now you're going to think, oh, these aren't substantive. But it means there's a change in the word form. So pleaded is changed to pled based on earlier text forms. Becoming as gods, the capitalization is taken away to lowercase. Now I think this is a mistake. It should be capitalized. It's referring to originally to Genesis 3, verse 5, where Satan says to Eve that if you partake of this tree, you will know good and evil, and you will be as the gods, or as God, become as gods. Okay, it means you will be sentient beings that can de choose between right and wrong. And because probably Satan says it, the King James Bible has lowercase, but the 1611 had it capitalized. And modern editions capitalize it. Because when you go later on into Genesis 3, verse 22 has God showing up and saying, aha, I can see you've partaken of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and you've become like us. So it really should be. But I think they're thinking, I don't know they're thinking, but I think it was because the current King James has lower case that they made the change. They should change the King James back to the 1611. That's the only one I disagree with. By the way, all of these are discussed in the analysis of textual variants. But they came out in 2004. They did not come out in 2013. Okay? Restore and so forth in the Helaman preface at the end. It was originally et cetera, and the critical text has et cetera, but they've been replacing et cetera, because you might not know what it means. And then the people's sake is in the plural, and they change it to the singular, which is correct, because people has never used peoples in the plural in the Book of Mormon. It's always in the singular. So this, and it probably in context should be singular. So here we go. There are four more. So there's five. The 2013 has one more. So there's one change. 
and it is something I can't pronounce very readily. <laughs> but thou comfortest, oh, I just, anyway, I read it. It isn't English to me anymore. And it's because the King James Bible has the ST, not EST, and the earliest editions of the Book of Mormon and the manuscripts have ST, not EST. There are no other textually sub substantive changes in the new LDS text. There's only one. Should there be more? Well, so this is what I have been working on called the earliest text published in 2009. One of the important things for me in the critical text project is to make it public and independent. And I have worked by even legal agreement to make sure, because I work for BYU and thus really work for the church, to make it independent and um, that the, we, by agreement, can publish the results so that everyone can see what has been found. Um, the, it is, we call it the earliest text because there was cons some concern that we really can't tell that it's the original text. Remember I said the original text is what Joseph Smith would be given through the instrument. And of course there, is, there are areas where you can't be really sure. So we decided to call it the earliest text. And uh, Yale was not happy with the original text as a title. The church was not happy with the original text. And so we came up with the earliest text as one that's more neutral. But it still intends it to be the original text of the Book of Mormon to the extent it can be determined. We really have to add that. And I should say by scholarly means, academic, textual, critical means. I have not received at any time the Spirit saying to me, this is the correct reading, change it. <laughs> I haven't. I have not asked for it, and I don't believe it belongs to me. That does belong to the brethren, as prophets, seers, and revelators, to get that kind of information. So the Critical Text Project is academic and scholarly and doesn't pretend to any other thing, and it is a stage which shows the hand of human error. There are mistakes, I'm sure. Okay. It follows those six books, the analysis of textual variants. The reasons for publishing. One, I've realized from like the Restored Covenant Edition, anybody could go out and take those six books and just create my text and print it. And I didn't want to have an Erasmus. If you know the story of Erasmus, he basically did a quick and dirty job on the Greek New Testament to beat out the Catholic priest down in, in Spain who had done a, a really fine job. I didn't want any Erasmus doing this to me. So that was one of my main motivations. And by agreement, I could publish the results of my work. The other was, unfortunately, a lack of citation. People, even today, don't want to look in the six big books. They don't carry them to church. <laughs> and so I wanted a single volume that would give the text as it had been determined in the six books and a listing in the back of important changes that have occurred in the history of the text. You will not find in the back a list of the Yale edition versus the 1981 edition. Many of the readings in there are ones that the 1981 edition has correct. They've been changed over time, and you can read each one. They're all significant. There's only 719 in this book in the, um, in the Yale edition. Uh, Yale did the dust jacket, which I hated. And they would not accept my typesetter's beautiful version. But they did concede by making the inside hardcover look like the six books. So it ties this in to those. OK. Um, so I wanted people to cite 
the Yale edition. Many people, though, over the years, last 20 years, keep asking me, when are the brethren going to put these changes in the Book of Mormon? You got your answer last Friday, at least for a generation, I would guess. Maybe I'm wrong. So my belief is if you're going to do scholarly work on the Book of Mormon, there, the text is out there, one that is accurate based largely on manuscript readings. Let's look at that. So one of the important things about the Yale text is it restores a lot of readings from the manuscripts. These are ones you can go and look and say, oh yeah, it isn't Skousen just making this up. This is what it reads. They are described in here and very often then explain why they are correct. They, you make the text much more systematic. There are 493 newly discovered readings from the manuscripts alone, 216 from the original manuscript. Even though we only have 28%, that original manuscript is really important. And I will say the Joseph Smith Papers has agreed with me and Robin Jensen to produce transcripts and photographs of both manuscripts the original with the fragments put in place, and the printer's manuscript, which is basically intact. And then you too can go out and look and see. I think this is a great step forward that anyone can view the actual photographs. There are 187 from the printers where O is not extant. We don't have it. 88 from both of them. That means the typesetter made the mistake. It happened later, and two from extra copies of the title page. But more important is how many changes make a difference in meaning. And there are 241 that I've counted. These are ones that will show up in translation. The words are different. Now, I would say this. None of these are going to change the doctrine or the basic narrative, although they change the details of the narrative, and they will sometimes restore the correct doctrine, but they never change the doctrine, and they make the stories read more consistently. If you want to read a brief summary of why I think these changes need to be taken into account in a scholarly edition, the December issue of BYU Studies has an article where I write about 30 changes, which I believe are sort of pretty strong that you would want to have in your study of the Book of Mormon. And so if you want to read sort of a summary of some of the, the really, I think, clear examples, 30 of them, these are, for the most part, well, not all of them, but most of them meaning changing. Okay. Um, there are then these differences, and there are 15 name changes, a couple of them quite important. One of them, there are no Amalekites, there are Amalekites, no Amalekites, there's not an extra group. It's a mistake that Oliver introduced to the text. Okay, but there's another important thing about the Yale, and this is the text is being shown in a new way that you have not seen the text before in this way. And this is in sense lines. It is not poetry. People have said, oh, you've said it in poetry. No. The idea behind the sense lines is, and we have evidence from the manuscript, that Joseph Smith dictated in phrases, coherent phrases, and clauses. He isn't going to break in the middle of, in the, and then say, wilderness, you know, later. It's in the wilderness. He will do it in terms of phrases. And the original idea I had was that we would approximate his dictation by giving the lines breaking where it would be reasonable for him to break. Not that I know where he broke, you know, I don't, but it's an idea, to, if you read the Yale edition out loud, there's some sense in which you are reenacting Joseph Smith's reading out of the text to his scribe. That was the original idea. Uh, 
It turns out, though, that readers like it for other reasons. Is It makes it a lot easier to read. The punctuation and end of line support each other. So narrow columns are splitting words, phrases. It is very stressful to read the two columns. You don't think so, but when you get done with a chapter, you've had it. <laughs> you've read your, you've read it. <laughs> One reader, she started in the Yale edition, and before she knew it, she was on the fourth chapter, and she was amazed. And she said, I've never read more than one chapter at a time. And it's because the text will just flow. Um, of course, you know, I'm advocating this text, <laughs> so I'm probably biased. Um, even Isaiah is easier to read. Isaiah is very difficult because it isn't really the same kind of language as the Book of Mormon. P many scholars have told me they see the text anew when they see it, when it's lined up. And even children like reading it, and one autistic child loved it because the verses were so short. She meant a line. She could read it because it was a line. That was her verse. So people can be helped, I think, in just the reading of the text. Here's what it looks like. And the verses and chapters are out in the column because they don't really belong. So they're out there. You need them to find things, but we're not going to even put them in the text. Uh, there's extra lines for new. We tried to put in some breaks for paragraphs. So this is added, and the punctuation is added, and so forth. This is an original chapter break. There wasn't the word chapter, so we're not going to use it, but there's this little squiggly mark that we use to stand for original chapter breaks. Joseph saw something saying the end of the section. Okay. How did we do this? Um, I just mentioned, okay, we will add the accidentals and so forth. We will use the LDS chapter and verse. We'll use Orson Pratt's. It's the one, the RLDS, don't get theirs. And, um, okay. So how did we construct this? The text is not keyed in, not one word. The punctuation was keyed in, but we didn't key it in. And that's sort of unusual. Uh, there is no copy text. I don't have a manuscript. I don't have a form that I sit there typing in. What it's coming from is automatically generated from the computerized electronic collation. That I wrote a program to take in the 20 editions and the two manuscripts in streams. And they found the differences. And I would line them up. And then later I went through and used underlining to show what I believe to be the original text, the earliest text. Um, then there will go through several stages once we have it. So let me just briefly show that and we'll be done. So here is the collation. This will actually appear uh, maybe online, maybe um, you know, in a word crunch version and so forth on a, on a CD where you can look up any phrase and so forth. But this is the basis of it. And this is what I used to write those books because I could use, look up any phrase and how it had changed and so forth. Um, most of them, you can see at the end, numbers, punctuation number and so forth. But there are changes, like a that being deleted and so forth. Things that are in bold are in the original manuscript, actually there. Underlining is what I think it should read. I put modern spellings in. The zero and one stand for the manuscripts, like Lemuel is spelled this way, not a capital. And there's the printer's manuscript, and there's A through T, which are 1830, 1981. And you can see we don't have to do the 2013. <laughs> there are six changes. So I'm not going to put it in the collation. <laughs> it just, you just have a little section in volume three. Okay. So 
underlining is what it is. Then Daryl Lonsdale, my good colleague, wrote a computer program to extract the underlying text. And we compared that, though, against the 1981 edition, our electronic version, just to make sure that we hadn't accidentally wiped out. You know, his program could be wrong. We gotta make sure it works right. And so we checked those kind of things. So here it is. This is the underlying text, the proposed original text. This is much what the typesetter got in 1830, uh, just straight text. And the only main difference would be with A and D, he had an ampersand because Oliver wrote ampersands. But otherwise, this is what he was confronted with. And I'm gonna go through somewhat of what he went through. So the first thing I do is I put in the sense lines and I do the paragraphing. I put extra lines for paragraphs. And you will notice, by the way, when we get done, that I am going across the chapter break that Orson Pratt put in. He broke in the wrong place. We'll see it as we get here. Uh, did I skip to? Okay, the second stage was I go outside and put the verse and chapter numbers in. And I had to make some shifts. Like that Isaiah, when he goofed, I changed it. I made it right. What he intended, because he got it in the other two copies, so we make it right. Okay, so here you have those. Notice chapter four. It's Nephi, or the brothers say, and even he can slay 50, then why not us? And Nephi gives his answer, why in a new chapter? But I don't know what went on in Orson's mind that day. He didn't usually do this, but he just, he, I guess he felt like, I gotta have a chapter break here. So he did it. But the answer, maybe it was then it came to pass, sort of affected him. But, you know, I spake it to my brother saying, let us go up again. He's, he's still talking, the same conversation. So we put it, we don't put a paragraph break. And now, the hardest part. This was the hardest part in the Yale edition, redoing what John Gilbert did. John Gilbert did two-thirds of the accidentals on the fly as he was typesetting. And the Book of Mormon is not easy to do punctuation. And he did it about a third of the time he marked up his manuscript in advance. But two-thirds, this is the way. And, and you know, of course, I'm taking all the time in the world you know, to do this. But this was the hardest thing for me, and it gave me a new appreciation for what he did. As far as I know, this is the only, at least in print, the only time it's been done again, from scratch. Now, people have gone through and revised John Gilbert's, but try it from scratch sometime. It's, you'll, you'll have an appreciation for what he did. He was proud to the end of his life of the work he did on the Book of Mormon. Okay, so next time we're going to talk about the nature of this original text and there are a lot of surprises. And here's just a few of them that we'll be talking about. And, um, and all of these except for, I know Jack Welsh got uh, I think the first identical citation, but so many of these other things have come from the project. And the evidence suggests that Joseph Smith got the text word for word. He saw it letter for letter. And his job was to read it off. Now that's pretty mundane, but none of you have probably gotten a revelation that way. Well, I'm not, I don't want an answer. <laughs> And we're going to bring up another big issue. Are there conjectural emendations in the text? And I'll just let you know that the current text has over 600 conjectures because what they were confronted with didn't make sense. And the Yale edition agrees with many of those, actually. So it's not like they're just completely diverse. But so if you want to find out about the text of the Book of Mormon, and how radically different it is than it's been perceived, and that even the bad grammar might be intentional. 
from God himself. Well, you'll have to come. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want to say one thing about Bob Smith. Um, I don't think he liked to put his name on his book, but uh, he did the first critical text of the Book of Mormon, 1984 to 86, two editions of it. And um, because he did it, the idea was out there, okay, this is what we need to have. And so it led me to uh, want to uh, do more and improve on the kind of things, the preliminary steps that he had done. So we're grateful to, to Bob for having done that. Okay, questions? Referring to last week's lecture, if I understood, um, you stated that Emma said that Joseph translated the Book of Mormon by reading that seer stone that he placed in a hat, and that that was different from the Urim and Thummim. What are the sources for that? I did a little looking up trying to find something about seer stone other than Hiram Page. Uh, didn't find it. Looked in the green volume from the CES. Uh, what? Well, um, or is it is it a matter of thinking through? No, I think of uh, Dan Vogel's books probably have most of these uh, statements, and uh, I know Jack Welch has also the statements of these early witnesses. They're collected, and um, and of course the originals are in newspaper accounts and so forth that they wrote, and they all refer. Basically, they refer to the stone. They don't usually call it the seer stone, the stone. Sometimes um, in, in one interview, Martin Harris said that he could use either the Nephite interpreters, which would be the Urim and Thummim, or the seer stone, and he found the seer stone more convenient. He used it more often. Now, this would be on the 116 pages. David Whitmer claimed that he never got back the Nephite interpreters after he lost 116 pages that he only had to, he could only use the stone. Um, and others disagree with that and that interpretation of his, but the accounts from first-hand witnesses seem to imply the stone is the major one that is being used. Thank okay. you. Having worked in the printing industry from teenager, uh, you made reference to press proofs on the Book of Mormon in the Grandin print shop. Right. But we, we make galley proofs, that's more for newspaper, but page proofs? But I, I haven't heard, the only... No, they did, they did, they had the whole 16 page thing Pre that they did the proofing on. That's and from the press. One of the really good examples of this is the 22nd signature was set from the printers, we talked about this last time, and was proofed against the original. And it goes from the very beginning to the end of those 16 pages. So it isn't that they just took one page or a group, they took all 16. So that's my presumption is uh, they didn't do it from galleys or partial, they waited till they had the full 16 set. Uh, th that's the evidence argues for that. Well, the galleys are out of the question because they knew the page size, but the only page proof then was the uh, title page. There's no evidence of any. Uh, well, page you have proofs. the 37th one in the Wilford Wood, and you have the clear evidence that the 22nd was proofed against the original. So there are three, three places where we have evidence. Two for an actual proof sheet and well, for the title page. We don't have, they, they said that when Joseph was there, they just set up the title page and did the proof on it and they were handing it out. So there would have been later the 15 more that they did after Joseph left. Joseph was not in the press shop hardly ever. Right, he was yeah. down in Susquehanna. But the evidence all works for the idea that they didn't do galley proofs or individual page proofs. They, they did individual page proofs? No, they did not. Oh. 16 pages okay. at a time, the actual signature.
does the chapter heading in the saying that the Riverside and run from south to north still ex in the new 13, 213 edition? Well, I haven't seen it, but you can come up here and look at the 2004 double day because it's probably not going to be any different. Basically, the 2013 Book of Mormon is the 2004, except for, uh, you know, I've, I, I've got a, there's a few other places where there's also slight differences, but, you know, as far as that goes, it's, it's a very minor revision of the 2004. Uh-huh. I, I have a question about the 81 text. Uh-huh. Uh, when I was here, I worked well, just for a c couple of weeks with uh, Professor Rasmussen, they were putting together footnotes and all right. that. And I remember sitting with my cousin, working through sheets that he handed out, and now I hear you talking about the footnotes being generated by computer. Can you tell me where I fit in? <laughs> oh, they had humans checking them, you know, but they left a lot of men that were computer generated. You can find them. You know, you just start going through, and every so often you'll see one that is just the same word, and it's irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, I, I reckon. They got this. through. Yeah, I, yeah, they had people checking, but they finally decided that there were too many, too, way too many. You know, if there are too many, or if every time you look down it says, see Jesus Christ topical guide, what happens? You stop looking. So you can't, you know, these things have to be used judiciously and relevantly. And my understanding is, you can go check it. See, we don't have them in the 2004. The Doubleday has no footnotes, so you can't tell. But it should be in the 2013, and that probably is the most dramatic change. My understanding is that they're equivalent to the ones that have appeared in the Spanish triple. But I haven't checked it yet, so I'll just sort of say I don't know. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, I think he's going to ask, he wants to ask a question. And I think I talked longer this time. Where are you, Paul? <laughs> Paul left. Oh, <laughs> here he is. <laughs> you were promising. I was promising I wouldn't talk so long, but it's so interesting. Okay, go ahead. Uh, my question is in your Yale edition, uh, what are some of the markers that you used to uh, indicate that this was the length of phrase that uh, Joseph dictated that Oliver wrote? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. In fact, in some cases, we know Joseph dictated too much. We can tell in the original that sometimes he dictated like 20 words. He got, just kept going. And, and that's what I'm Some asking. people of you have been in places where they, they, dict, they say too much. You know what happens when you say too much. So, so when he would say too much, you would get occasions where the scribe would start out with Joseph and then he'd put at the end of what Joseph had done, and he didn't have to cross it out and put the middle that he had missed, and then put the end, and you end up with 20, some 25 words for some of these, which means Joseph just read too much. So I think normally he would slow her down, and we don't, I don't really know. Obviously what happens in the Yale edition is we're gonna run out of paper on the page. We can't put too many words, you know, sometimes there were places where you sort of felt like you wish you had a little more space and throw a couple more words in there, but, you know, we, we were restricted. So the, the notion is to give you the idea of reading by phrases and clauses rather than actually knowing. We couldn't look at the manuscript and say, oh, we can tell they, he gave it to this point and so forth. We just couldn't do it, so we don't try. Okay. Okay, here's a question. You can leave at any time, please. Just yeah, feel free. I, we're not taking roll. When I, at, at classes, if I just turn to the board, I just know there are people trying to sneak out, and I always notice it. Okay, go ahead. Uh are the videos of these lectures going to be available like on the Maxwell Institute website or something? Well, uh, let's put it this way. 
uh, the Maxwell Institute is, is hoping to be able to do this. But if it doesn't happen, it will happen by other means, I can assure you. <laughs> it will be online out there somewhere. And, and yeah, there's another possibility too, but um, we just, you know, we'll, we'll get it out. Okay. Royal, thank you for the excellent talks. A uh, quick question. There is another edition available online in the Project Gutenberg yeah. archive. What is the provenance of that edition? I don't know. I don't look at them. I don't like electronic versions. I know you might, but they're such plastic things that keep changing. That's the real thing I've noticed is, and I think Gutenberg keeps changing. Maybe I'm wrong, but I just don't want to mess with electronic ones. So I don't even know what the churches has got, really. Yeah, but I mean, I don't want to evaluate it or anything. I'm just going to work off printed ones. But it's the 2004 edition, the current? Yeah, the current one that, well, no, I think that they got the 2013. Go look at comfort de dist and <laughs> that's... <laughs> okay. I think it's time to go home. So, thank you very much. <laughs>